Well, if you've ever wanted to get into the world of modeling, now's your chance. But instead of walking the runways in Milan, Paris, or New York, we're just going to be nestled in comfy in front of our computer. Our goal is to fully understand the randomness behind some process of interest in business analytics, whether it be the number of times a customer visits a website before making a purchase, whether or not it's the total amount of money a customer brings into a company before they churn, whether it's studying the lead times it takes for a product to be manufactured and delivered, we want to fully understand the range of variation in the outputs that we might observe. So let's motivate this example by talking about trying to come up with a model for customer lifetime value. And the key point with this example that I want to stress is that just looking at averages of random processes is not going to be enough for us to fully appreciate the variation in the quantity that we're trying to discover. So let's talk about customer lifetime value. So customer lifetime value is a formula that lets us know how much money a customer is worth over his or her lifetime with the company. So a customer might discover a store, they might love it, they might make a bunch of purchases. After a while, they get over it. What's the total amount of money that the customer has brought in? So what we're going to do is to take the viewpoint of Michelle, who's a director of marketing at M&J Jewelry, which is a direct mail jewelry catalog. So every quarter they send out a new catalog to a customer and the customers order stuff and uh, bring in money for the company. And so what Michelle would like to do is to target specific groups of customers with particularly high lifetime values or maybe those that are particularly high risk at churning. And so she asks accounting for some data to help better understand the customers. So how many items per order are customers ordering? How many purchases per year are customers typically making? And you know, before the customer finally leaves the company and stops ordering altogether, what's the total number of purchases that we can expect from the customer? And accounting just comes back with some averages for us. So on average, the typical customer spends about $250 per purchase. They make purchases about four times a year from the catalog. The gross margin associated with the purchase is 40%, so the average profit per customer purchase is about $100, since the average customer is spending about $250 per purchase. The retention rate from year to year is about 65%, so if we see a customer in one year, there's about a 65% chance we'll see them the next year when they end up making purchases. And if we want to factor in the cost of acquiring a new customer, that's going to be right at around $480. Their strategy right now is just to mail off these catalogs to people that haven't discovered their company and just see what the overall response rate is. So it's a lot of catalogs they have to end up mailing out. And the cost of mailing a catalog to a current customer is about $10. So since we're going to be gauging future value of future purchases, we're going to discount it back to today's dollars with a 10% discount rate. All right, so how would we get customer lifetime value? What we can do is we can start out with the acquisition cost, start out in the hole for about $480, and then perform a sum over the number of years that the customer is making purchases through the catalog, factoring in the amount they're spending per year, the gross margin, the cost that it takes to send catalogs out to the customers, and then finally discounting future value into the present day.
now. You might notice that the formula that we've written here has a kind of funny mathematical symbol. You might have seen this in previous classes. This is what's known as the summation symbol, this big Greek letter sigma. We see at the bottom we have i equal to 1, and at the very top we have years. So actually before moving on with this example, let's discuss very briefly what summation notation is all about. It's basically just a shorthand that allows us to represent the sum of many different quantities a lot more compactly, saves us a bunch of space. And really a summation notation acts a lot like a for loop that we've been programming in R. So let's imagine that we would like to sum up the quantity i times i plus 1 for values of i of 1, 2, 3, and 4. So we want to sum up the expression 1 times 1 plus 1, 2 times 2 plus 1, 3 times 3 plus 1, 2, 4 times 4 plus 1 here. So summation notation is going to allow us to write that compactly. Basically what we write is the nugget, the expression that we want to be summing, the i times i plus 1, and then talk about, well, what values of i do we want to loop through in order to get the final value of the sum. So at the bottom of that uh, summation notation, we'll say i is equal to 1 to give it a starting value, and at the top of that notation, we'll give it the final value that i is going to take, with the understanding that it's going to go through that integer sequence 1, 2, 3, 4. So very much like a for loop. If we defined s to be the sum, uh, originally starting out to be 0, and just said for i in 1 colon 4, for values of i of 1, 2, 3, 4, take the current value of s, add i times i plus 1 to it, overwrite the value of s there. At the end of that for loop, well, s will contain the sum over those four expressions. So summation notation, we'll see that a lot in this class. It's used a lot in business analytics, and it's really just shorthand for taking the sum of a bunch of quantities where each term in that sum is basically the same expression, just plugging in a different value each time. So customer lifetime value will be the sum of the amount of money that the customer brings into the company over each year the customer is continuing to make purchases discounted to the present day. So if we use those averages that accounting has given us, here's what we end up getting. We throw those terms into the sum. We find that the lifetime value with this expression works out to be about $490. So we did the computation, it's really not too bad. Does that mean that the typical lifetime value of a customer is $490? Well, surprisingly, the answer is not necessarily. And so here's gonna be one of these key lessons. If we wanna summarize a fairly complex random process just by working with averages, we might actually grossly underestimate or overestimate what the average value is of the final outcome of that process. So here, there's actually a bunch of random quantities that are involved in this sum that we've replaced just with averages. The number of years that a customer is making purchases with the company is gonna be variable, some one, some 10, some three, some five. Also, the amount of money that they were spending per year is gonna be variable as well. Sure, the average is $1,000, but some are gonna spend more, some are gonna spend less. And so by replacing random quantities in equations just with the average, we might actually just not really come up with a good estimate of what the average value is of that final quantity, the customer lifetime value in this case. So why is that? Why aren't averages good enough? Well, let's explore a couple of scenarios. Let's imagine that the number of years that a customer shops with this company is equally likely to be anywhere from one to five. So the average is three, as accounting was reported. And let's assume that the amount spent per year has an average of $1,000, but it varies anywhere between $200 and $2,400, peaking at 400. And that triangle gives an idea of the relative frequencies of the different numbers that we can expect to see for the amount spent per year over the customers. And so let's add a bit of realistic randomness to describe the customers more fully. Well, we can write a Monte Carlo simulation to actually see what that average customer lifetime value is. Basically, over the course of 100,000 different customers, first generate at random the number of years they're making purchases with that company, select a value between one and five, and then go ahead and for each one of those years, randomly select the amount of money that they spent in accordance with that triangular looking distribution that we just looked at and then throw that into the lifetime value formula. 
So after we've examined 100,000 different customers, well, asking for the average lifetime value, well, we find out that it's more like $460. Actually quite a bit less than that 490 that we got if we just used overall averages. And so we got a bit of a mismatch. And in fact, this mismatch can be even bigger if we use a different model for the randomness describing the number of years the customer is making purchases and their average spent per year. So what if instead of just equally likely one year through five years, what if instead we say a customer is going to be shopping with this company for between one and eight years with the following frequencies, kind of peaks at one and then tails off as we go up towards eight, but the average is still right at about three here. And what if we take as a probability model for the amount spent per year where they either spend $250 with a 40% chance or $1,500 with a 60% chance? The average is still 1,000 to be consistent with the averages reported by accounting. Well, with these probability models for the number of years and the amount spent per year, what do we get for the average lifetime value? Well, throwing that into the Monte Carlo simulation, randomly generating the number of years each customer continues spending with the company, and then the random amounts for each year that customer does so, we find that in this case, the average is more like $426. And that's a lot less than the 490 that we would have got if we just plugged in averages. And so that's really hammering home the point that if we do have some complex process, some number, that we're uh, calculating from a bunch of random components, it's simply just not good enough to plug in averages for those random components to come up with a guess of what we might see at the end. So that's one of the key things about why we want to have a full appreciation, a full understanding of the amount of randomness in the processes that we're studying in that in order to figure out you know, what we're really interested in, like customer lifetime value, we need to fully account for the bits of randomness that goes into that calculation. So summarizing each random component in a process just by its average ends up potentially yielding a very misleading impression of the average outcome of the process. And so we, as business analytics practitioners, we want to do a better job. We want to have a full understanding of the variation of all random components of what we're studying here. So once we have this, well, we can ask related questions like, you know, when should we stop actually sending catalogs to customers? You know, if they've gone four quarters without a purchase, should we stop? Have they churned? We could come up with some probability model that describes the number of purchase or number of quarters they go without making a purchase um, and still eventually returning. And maybe we could come up with a conditional type of distribution that describes the amount of money we expect after they've gone one quarter, two quarters, three quarters, four quarters, etc., without spending any sort of money. You can start seeing that there's a lot of potential to do some of this probabilistic modeling. All right, so I would say that the overall goal of probabilistic modeling is just a more complete understanding of the random processes under consideration. Sure, you could potentially set up a Monte Carlo simulation to just look at a bunch of different scenarios, but that might take a lot of time and we might have a lot of different questions that we want to probe. We might just not have the time to run the complete suite of Monte Carlo simulations. So we want to ask, well, is there some sort of formula that might do a good job describing the probability of each possible outcome to a random process under study? Or maybe there's at least a short table listing all the possible outcomes of their probabilities that we can use instead kind of speed up the process, and to just summarize very quickly all aspects of a random process. That would save a lot of time. That would add a little bit to an understanding. So what can we do in that vein? So it turns out this is a pretty important question. A lot of times in business analytics, we might not need probability models because the amount of data we have is just so vast, we have a great idea of the range of values we might observe for a random process, like lifetime value, and how likely each one of those values are. But we don't always have that luxury. If our data set is very small, we might not have even observed every possible value, and so there's really no way to estimate those probabilities. Or maybe some of those possible values are so rare that we hardly have seen them enough times to be confident in our estimates for those probabilities. So when the data doesn't really support our cause, well, how can we turn to the realm of probabilistic modeling to help us out? 
And it turns out that a lot of things that we do study in business analytics have notorious distributions that describe their possible values and probabilities really quite well. So we want to become familiar with the zoo of commonly used distributions. And it turns out they're used not only in business analytics, but in economics, in finance, in biology, in physics, just science in general, and engineering. 